Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. Let's talk gardening. And for Diane, let's make this a power-packed episode. So nice to have you here today. Have you ever thought of yourself as a little crazy as a gardener? Or have others told you how crazy you are about gardening? Well, that's one of the things I want to talk about today because there's been a lot in this last week in particular that is kind of shaking up the gardening world. And so I want to share some of the recent news and also my own experiences this year. And I want to hear about your craziness too. And so I I don't mean when I say that gardeners are crazy or I'm going to be talking about craziness. I'm not necessarily talking about being deranged or insane, though, as I've mentioned in previous videos and live streams, gardeners almost by definition are a bit insane. You can say Einstein's typical comment about insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Yeah, that explains a lot of our gardening season. So while we might be insane by Einstein's definition. I think of craziness as just an exuberance, an excitement about gardening. I'm crazy about gardening, but it's really blurred lines when we talk about insanity and craziness. And so that's some of what I'll be talking about. Nice to see so many people checking in. Thanks, of course, to Heidi and Jay are fantastic moderators, and it looks like many of you are already getting frost. I hope your season is able to extend past this point. Mine's pretty much coming to an end. And so as my season, my growing season tends to come to an end, of course, I spend more time watching videos, checking out news, reading books, and some of the big news this week is about pepper X. Did you hear about this? Officially, according to Guinness, the hottest pepper in the world is the pepper X. It comes in at over 2.69 million Scoville heat <laughs> units. That's just crazy. That's insane. When we talk about growing a pepper that is that hot. And by comparison, the previous official record holder was the Carolina Reaper at about 1.6 million Scoville units. Now, I've mentioned that this season I was growing super hot peppers. They're still growing in my greenhouse. I've already harvested a bunch of them, the yellow T-Rex and the devil's brain, both of which are in the 1 to 1.2 million Scoville heat unit range. And I've been called crazy. Why would a gardener do that? I wanted to do it so I could say I did because they're beautiful plants. And so I can kind of figure out what one would do if they grew super hot peppers. So I made a batch of peach jelly last month. And to that peach jelly, I added a devil's brain super hot pepper. Now, normally I make a, a peach habanero hot pepper jelly. I love it. It's one of the favorites of my family. And when I make that, I'll put three habanero peppers in the jelly juice. This year, I put one of the devil's brain into that pepper juice or into that peach juice. And it came out spicy, not super hot, comparable to three habaneros. And I was able to use my super hot peppers in that way. And I'm still trying to figure out what else I'm going to do. But to advance that to 2.69 million heat units, to me, is just absolute craziness. But what does that mean to me as a gardener and maybe to you? I'd like to grow it just to say I did. And I think that's crazy. I think it's crazy to grow things that really don't serve much purpose. It's too hot to eat. It's too hot to, 
for most of us to even think about sprinkling on our food, but you can say you did it. Wouldn't that be awesome to say you did it? Now, currently, it's not available. Ed Curry, who has developed this pepper, is not selling them to home gardeners. He's the same guy that actually developed their Carolina Reaper 10 years ago. The process of developing a super hot, record-breaking chili pepper takes about 10 years. There's a lot of dedication. There's a lot of experimentation to get to that point. So a question for you, is that crazy? Is it crazy to spend 10 years developing a type of plant, any type of plant, to compete at the world record level, or just to be able to say to yourself that you were able to accomplish something as unique as the hottest pepper. So let me know in your comments what you think about the craziness. Have you done anything crazy like that in your garden? And how about pumpkins? Also this week, the world record was broken for the heaviest pumpkin coming in at 2,749 pounds of fruit off a plant. 2,749 pounds for a pumpkin. That was Travis Ginger. Craziness. Now, I've attempted to grow giant pumpkins. Most of it is in the genetics. You got to get the right kind of seed. I was not growing the super, super heavy kind. Atlantic dill is the pumpkin I was growing. And I got about 100 pounds when I was at, at the, the school garden. And a 100-pound pumpkin is big. And I'm proud of that. And it was awesome. And it was crazy to attempt to even to grow that. But over a ton of a pumpkin, the amount of time, he said that he was watering as many as 12 times per day. So when we get to this level of craziness, it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of time, a lot of effort. And so the big question as a gardener is, is it worth it? Is it something you would be willing to do? And I have to admit, I've been willing to grow those super hot peppers and those bigger than normal pumpkins. And my buddy, Tony O'Neill from Simplify Gardening, was really spending a lot of time trying to develop world-class vegetables and trying to set records. And he shows some of that in his videos on his channel. But is it an obsession? Is it insanity? Is it craziness? Or is it just being a gardener and trying some new cool things? Because we can. Riverdale Gardens, nice that you have the day off today. I grew Reapers and Apocalypse Scorpion this year. Is that crazy? I think that's pretty cool. I haven't grown an Apocalypse Scorpion, but with a name like that, think about the stories you can tell. If people come to your garden, you can point out, yeah, that's the Apocalypse Scorpion. That's craziness. Boothby Gardens, do you get the flavor of the pepper in your peach jam or just the heat? And so I I like the, the taste of many of the hot peppers, but when it's in the jelly juice and with all the sugar that's necessary when you make jelly, you really don't get the flavor of the, the peppers. It's just the heat. But making the pepper sauce is the way to get the taste in it. And so I was gifted with a super hot pepper sauce, extremely flavorful. It was really, really good, but it is so hot that it is used very, very sparingly. So even a drop is exceedingly hot, but there is flavor that to it. So to get the flavor of those kind of peppers, you really need to just have the peppers by themselves and try to endure the heat. But I like the heat, which is why I add it to uh, my peach. I also make a plum chipotle jelly that is a lot of fun and a roasted pepper jam that is really good and a jalapeno jelly that is really good so i like the heat with the jalapeno jelly i i i use jalapeno peppers there's recipes out there where you use apple juice and you mix a little bit of 
pepper into it. But when I make my jalapeno peppers, it's just the jalapeno peppers and they're ground up pretty fine to make it into the jelly. And you do get the jalapeno flavor with a, a recipe like that. So uh, it's, it's a balance between what you're willing to put up with. And Lama Lama says, I'm a wuss when it comes to spice. I tap out at anything hotter than a jalapeno. So jalapenos, generally, m many of what we would grow in the garden are in the 8,000 to 12,000 Scoville heat unit range. Yes, comparing that to 2.69 million is just insane. And what makes it even more insane, more crazy in my opinion, is that the way that Guinness tested the peppers, they took an average. So it's an average of 2.699 million Scoville heat units. Reportedly, some of those peppers are more than 3 million Scoville heat units, which allowed them to set the average that they did. I think that's crazy. But I also think it's something that I want to try. So it's it, it's crazy. Linda's wondering, how do you weigh a pumpkin that big? With a crane. You actually have to lift it with a crane onto an industrial scale to 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 weigh it. And you know, that in itself is a bit of craziness, if you ask me. So I think it's funny. Sherry says I think I'd be weirded out growing a pumpkin bigger than my dog. Uh, yeah, I have a, a, a photo of my 100-pound pumpkin sitting on a table with my young granddaughter sitting next to it. And my granddaughter wasn't much bigger than that pumpkin. And we have gone to pumpkin festivals here in Colorado where the pumpkins were bigger than my grandkids. So... Um, forget the dog. Imagine that the pumpkin is bigger than your children or your grandchildren. Those are big pumpkins. So lots of craziness. Uh, yeah, Dusty says one meteorologist tries every year. That's a lot of pumpkin. And uh, there's there are, if you're interested, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today as well. If you're interested in some of these record-setting fruits and vegetables, there are often organizations to help you out. There's a giant pumpkin growing association here in Colorado. And so I checked them out those years ago when I was at the school. Lots of helpful information on how to grow a giant pumpkin because that's what they're doing. And they have a website with lots of information. So I know the Colorado giant pumpkin growers have a web page. I'm sure there are many, many others out there for all of these different crazy things that we might be growing in the garden. Tennessee Hannah says, I'm just a crazy little old lady of the neighborhood, and that's without doing anything. Uh, you know, I think it is a, a, a little craziness in most of us that are willing to admit that we're gardeners, but uh, whether our neighbors think we're crazy or not, yeah, they probably think we're on the crazy inside. The LR978, I agree. It's not crazy. It's important to keep challenging oneself in any and every area. And so that's why I like to use the definition of craziness. Extremely enthusiastic because I use that enthusiasm, exactly as you point out, to challenge myself and to try new things. And that's that's really the, I want to have fun with today's episode talking about craziness but that's really the underlying tone is ideas to try something new, to experiment and to enjoy it. And you don't have to start off with a 10 year effort to try to produce a record breaking pepper, but maybe you could try growing a couple different types of squashes and allowing cross pollination and then taking that hybrid seed and grow it and see what happens. I, I talk about that in a, a recent video with the land race gardening is what that concept is called, where you just let things grow. And the best and strongest plants in your garden are the ones that you grow in your garden. Many gardeners, probably many of you, want a very specific plant with a very specific fruit, a very specific harvest, 
And that's what you're growing. And that's what you're going to save the, the seed from. And so for most of us who do that, it's a little crazy to think that you will intentionally let your plants hybridize for the next season. And then you just experiment and try something new and see what happens. It's crazy. But imagine the enjoyment, the satisfaction if you do that and you find out that you've got a plant that tastes better, that looks better, that grows better. Now who's crazy? It's a relative spectrum as to how we think of ourselves in our garden world and whether we're crazy or not. Romila said, I started my peppers too late, didn't get great yields this year, lesson learned, but still got a hundred or so peppers, awesome. My tomatoes were babied, however, so they took up all the main space. Nothing wrong with that. My tomatoes took up most of the space as well. And, uh, and so when we talk about a hundred peppers, in a failed season, I look at a lot of gardeners who think that's crazy. That means you had to grow a whole bunch of plants. I know gardeners that might grow one or two bell pepper plants, and that's all they're going to do. Nothing wrong with that. And we 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 talk about uh, other growers that I know that are growing hundreds of plants. You look at Joe over at Garden State Gardener Channel, and he's growing hundreds and hundreds of pepper plants. And so a failed season for him is thousands of peppers. So what degree of craziness are you when you look at your garden and what you're harvesting and where you are on the spectrum of craziness in the garden? And Jay is pointing out that I was on the Urban Gardener show on Saturday. Jay was there too, always does a fantastic job on live streams. And uh, thanks for putting that link out there, Jay. And uh, Enoch and I on that live stream on Saturday, uh, we're talking about uh, the Pepper X and the, the heaviest pumpkin of, of this last week. And it is talk in the gardening community. And I think it should be, not necessarily because you're going to try to emulate what those other growers are doing, but it gives us ideas of something that maybe we weren't sure if we wanted to try it in our garden or we're not sure if it's going to work in our garden. Well, by looking at what some others have done on that craziness spectrum, maybe it'll give you the motivation. Maybe it'll give you that extra little bit of, of push you need to try something new and run with it. See how see where it, go, it goes. Jay is saying pumpkins that are big enough to make a Cinderella carriage. Absolutely. Some of those are incredibly big. Colorblind Gardener, hello to you. I make multiple batches of hot sauces every year. It's a bit tricky to get the flavor at the same time as having a good amount of heat there. And that's where I'm at. That's that's exactly why I'm experimenting with this craziness is to try to find that balance as I make my my pepper sauces and my pepper powders. It's it's finding that blend of the, the taste with the heat. And you often have to allow yourself that experimentation and that little bit of craziness to actually get to that point and, exceed, and try to see where it goes. And Jay says, extremes in gardening can be exhilarating and motivating in other areas. Absolutely. Very well said, Jay. I, I can't agree more. Sherry is saying, in the ongoing story of my San Marzano's, I've got nine cuttings, throwing water roots. Good for you. Got coir and some organic potting soil for step two. Fingers crossed for a 2024 summer garden. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Looking forward to an update. I've harvested all my San Marzano's and they're actually in the freezer right now for me to make a sauce in the months ahead. And I, I was a little crazy. I, I think I, what did I put in? I forget this specific number. I think I had 15 paste tomato plants this year for just making sauce. I think that's crazy. I've never done that before. I've never had that many of the paste tomatoes for the purpose of just making sauce. I love my cherry tomatoes for snacking. I like my black creme for cutting up in a salad. 
but I haven't grown the tomatoes just for making sauce. So I stretched myself this year and did try something new. I thought it was a little crazy at the time, but I'm glad I did it because now I've got all these tomatoes to make sauce and moving on to that next stage. And so at, as, as you look to next season, and that's, that's another reason I wanted to talk about this today at the end of this season. As you look to next season, start thinking about what you're going to do differently. Those new things, that little bit of craziness. I did a video last year where I just went to the store, picked up a bag of pinto beans, and then put those pinto beans in the garden. It's a simple project that a lot of school kids learn, and I got a lot of comments from people saying, yeah, I did that in school, but I'd never done it before. I strongly suspected it would work, didn't know for sure how well it would work, and I did it. And I thought that was a little bit crazy. And it's interesting as we look at what craziness means to some people, because I've been getting comments on that video from people saying that it was a waste of time, that the, the amount of harvest I got wasn't worth the effort, that I could have gone to the store and bought another bag of pinto beans and actually had more beans than what I harvested. But that's not the point for us gardeners. Others might think we're crazy because it's cheaper to buy it at the store or it's too much work or especially if it's not a se successful season, it's a waste of time. But I challenge and say that's the good side of being a crazy gardener. It's the harvest, not knowing what you're going to get, but then you get it. And it's exhilarating, like Jay said. It really is exhilarating to see the results of something that you had no clue what was really going to happen. You suspected what was going to happen. You hoped what was going to happen. But until it happened, it's, it's just a complete guess. And it is exhilarating to have that. So, so do it. Start thinking about those kind of things. And I'm interested to see if any of you want to share some of those craziness items, those things that you have tried, as some of you have already pointed out. But also, what are you thinking about doing next year that is different, that you've never done before, that ranks you on that craziness scale? Boothby saying, calculate how much tomato need to grow to last me the winter for sauce. There you go. And so, yeah, you could definitely do, as part of your winter planning, the, the, the prep, the calculation, how much you're going to, to need. And that's where the experimentation came in because I had a good year in the garden, but I had some really hot days, some really dry days right at the, the peak of the normal flowering of the tomato. So I didn't get as many as I had hoped to get on my paste tomatoes. And so my harvest now is an indicator in a, a relatively average year for tomatoes. I can figure out based on the plants I grew, how much sauce I'm going to get. But until I grew these plants, I had no idea how many plants I needed to grow in my garden for the sauce I wanna make. You, there, there are calculators out there. I have a video where I talk about how many plants you need to grow to feed your family based on average production and average use for a family. But it's the kind of thing that, that you need to figure out for yourself. And the only way you can really determine for sure is to do it. So yeah, do some calculations of what you think you're going to need. And then I would say increase that by 10 or 20% just to allow for plants that aren't going to produce or that are going to have problems based on the weather and then see what happens in your garden. I'll, I, I do that every year with the kind of things that, that I, I grow and that I'm experimenting with is I grow, always grow more than I need because I don't necessarily know what I'm going to get because I've never grown it before. CJ Don is saying, am I crazy this year? I will eradicate the disease on my tomatoes. That's awesome. It was really too late in the season to try, but I needed to learn how to handle the ebbs and flows 
and what varieties don't recover. I like that idea. And, and yeah, some might say you're crazy to think you can eradicate disease with your tomatoes. That's not crazy. I think that's a great goal. And definitely as you research and find out what varieties are disease resistant and which diseases are prevalent in your area and how you fight those diseases. Oh, I love that. I don't think that's crazy at all, but it's experimenting. And yes, that focus and the, the effort to get to that point, some might see as a little crazy. Gina McGregor, I've canned about 55 pints of tomato sauce this year. Awesome. I think that's about right for the year at one can per week. That's that's really good. So uh, a, a pint of tomato sauce, uh, I, I like having spaghetti or ravioli or lasagna most weeks. And a pint is actually more than I would be using in a week. So that's that's a lot of tomato sauce. I'm impressed. And uh, I would say that's a crazy amount of tomato sauce. So good for you. Keep going. Susan Sewing, I grew 103 chili peppers along my dra driveway, best location for sun. Started slow, but ended up being able to pickle, freeze, and give away unknown pounds and pounds of hatch and jalapeno peppers. That's fantastic. And, you know, that's the kind of craziness that that's, that's what I'm in, encouraging, where you're doing something, 103 chili peppers, that's insane uh, and from a lot of measures, but it's awesome because you're giving it away and you're sharing it and you're enjoying everything you can. So fantastic. And that's why being a crazy gardener is so much fun because you can brag about it and share your stories with others like us and actually share your harvests with the friends and families and neighbors. So uh, that's fantastic. Masabi Gal, I live in zone three, four, Northern Minnesota. My friend has a zone three wisteria. He's been growing for two years. He gave me seed pods to try growing them. Now what, crazy? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say attempting to grow wisteria in zone three is a little bit crazy, but hey, he did it. Why can't you do it? So it may start off as a crazy idea because we don't think it's going to succeed or we think it's a little crazy to even try. But when you do succeed, that's where the exhilaration comes in. And that's what makes it all worthwhile. So I, I think that's awesome. Grow wisteria in Minnesota and have fun with it. Yeah, there's the, the video that... Uh, I was talking about, thanks, Jay, for putting that link <coughs> where I planted the supermarket beans and they they turned out extremely well. You know, the I didn't really say it in the video, but a lot of what we grow in or what we buy in the supermarket is irradiated or doused with or sprayed with chemicals to hinder the growth so that they don't sprout in the store or so that they ha don't have any disease or bacteria that might be on them while they're on the shelf in the bag. And that was my biggest concern when I bought the, the pinto beans from the store, is I didn't know how viable they were. I didn't know how old they were, if those beans had been stored in a warehouse for years. And that was really the test, not whether you plant, plant a bean seed and it will grow. Of course it will. But when we buy our seeds from seed companies and it's their job to give us viable seed, it's different than if you just gamble and get seed from a source that isn't intending you to grow it and you don't know where it came from and you don't know how it was stored and all those other considerations. That's where the craziness of that experiment of mine came into play because I didn't know, but it worked. And a lot of people are surprised that, why would you do that? Of course, it's going to work. Well, there's a lot of variables in gardening that we don't know if they're going to impact the growing until we try it. So something to, to think about. Mark is saying, I grew some nice chili de arbol from seeds from a pack of dried chilies from the store. Always interesting to see what can grow. Awesome. Absolutely. And, and it is. It is one of those things that it is it is interesting 
and it is enjoyable. I enjoy it. Carla says, yeah, but where's the fun in going to the store to buy when you can grow those things? Absolutely. How cool is it to grow the things you'd otherwise have to buy? Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, I had a comment on that video. Um, I, I guess someone took the time to do the math and figured out that I saved 32 cents worth of beans by growing them myself. And it wasn't worth uh, all the effort. Well, Molly's coming in. You can see her tell. She's saying hello. Uh, well, 32 cents isn't the point when we're gardening. If we try to monetize everything that's happening in our garden, we would be crazy to continue because so much of what we do costs more than what others might think the benefit is. But I think the benefit is exactly that. It's cool to grow the things that otherwise you would have to buy. Even if it is just a few pennies, it's still awesome to do it. Thank you, Sister Homestead. I want to focus more on chili peppers next year. This year was grandiose hot peppers. So uh, I, I look forward to hearing about your, your efforts with the focus on chili peppers next year. And also share with us if you would next year and you start growing all those chili peppers. And for all the rest of you as well, share what you do with them. It's one thing to grow some of those crazy items in our garden, but then what do you do with it? Little things like, like sweet potatoes. It doesn't have to be hot peppers. It doesn't have to be giant pumpkins. Last year, I grew sweet potatoes also from the supermarket. And I'd never done that before. It's really difficult to have a good season here in Colorado because it's so short and the cold comes so quickly that we don't typically get good sweet potato harvest. But I did. They were small. I showed that in the, that video I made. But I was able to use those. You don't need to have the big mongo sweet potatoes like they sell at the store. The little sweet potatoes that I was able to grow, very tasty, beautiful, and I was able to eat them. So it it wasn't what I was expecting or hoping, but what I got was wonderful. And I was very happy with it. So that's what it's really about, making yourself happy. Sunset Farm Ohio is wondering, would store-bought dried beans be good as a cover crop? Oh, that's an interesting idea. So uh, I would say yes, generally. Hold on a second. Mala's chewing on a pine cone next to me. I want to make sure it wasn't anything worse than that. So anyway, um, yes, many of the cover crops that we use are legumes. They're peas and they're beans. And so depending on your climate, if it's warm enough and it's still got time to grow beans, then by all means, dried beans are an option. But you might also consider peas. Dried peas in the supermarket are going to be a little more cold tolerant. And so as a cover crop going into fall and into winter, peas typically are a better cover crop than beans. But when you can buy a one pound bag for very little amount, and that gives you hundreds of plants, then yeah, by all means, that could be a, an easy decision for, for getting the seeds for a cover crop and much less expensive than if you were to buy just those packets of beans and, and grow them specifically as a cover crop. So always a nice option to try to save money if you can. And those kind of things from the garden or from the supermarket into your garden can be a nice way to do it. Gina's saying cr garden craziness leads to intangible benefits like more satisfaction in life. I like that. Got to try it to see what it feels like. Well said. And so it's the trying and the seeing and the feeling and the enjoying and all of that. So, ma, quit making a mess. She normally just lies nice and quiet, but she's this is stick season for her. So as the, the plants are dying and more sticks are in the garden, she is bringing more and more sticks and just chewing. And I just love what that does to my carpet. So it just means I have to vacuum more often because she likes chewing on her sticks. So I'll I'll see if she gets up here and wants to say hello to everyone here in a little bit. Mike Watson says, I didn't realize how much garlic I went through in a year until I started growing my own and running out. Another gr great reason 
to, to, to put yourself on that craziness scale. And why I say always plan for at least 10 or 20% more than what you think you need. And so if you're growing garlic, for instance, because you use a lot of garlic, then get crazy with it and grow a lot more because you're always going to have the, the opportunity to preserve it if it's too much. But you may find out that it's not enough for you to actually eat and use in your recipes like you had hoped. So yeah, go crazy with the garlic next year and, and start growing more because it's easy to find out that you run out. I, I, I would rather have too much of something and then give it away than to run out and say, oh, now, I, now I need more. And it's, it's one of those, those things we learn as gardeners as we try to figure out how much we're going to grow of something is to reach that happy spot where, where we, uh, in our limited space in our gardens, are growing most efficiently based on what we're going to use and what we're going to 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 grow. Dusty Flats is saying starting all seedlings in the greenhouse next year and much later. Planting later misses a lot of pest pressures. There you go. That uh, I've said that before and I've I've recognized that before, but I saw it firsthand. I've talked a little bit about it this season because I was so late putting my plants in. I didn't even get my peppers and and tomatoes in the ground until the third week of June because my June was just so cold. Almost no pests. The only pest I had in my garden this year was grasshoppers, and they weren't that bad. So yes, if you've got pests in your garden, one of the ways to avoid the pests eating your plants or your harvests are to plant later. To, to get, I talk about this all the time, to understand the life cycle of the pest. And if you can put your plants in after that point in their life cycle where they are a pest, they're no longer a pest. You've been able to, to use their life cycle against them. So that's actually a great strategy to plant later if your season is long enough to allow for it. Chinese garden, I think it's kind of crazy to reset my entire backyard and change the direction of all my meds to go the other way. But I realized that it wasn't set the most effective way in 19. And so, uh, yeah, that, that is kind of crazy. That's, you know, I, I always talk about taking the time to figure out your garden, figure out your weather, figure out what you're going to do because it's a little crazy to change everything after you've put your garden in place. But on the craziness scale, I don't think it's that crazy. I think it's you looking at it and seeing the results of what you did and the fact that it needs to change. So you're going to change it. So uh, it, it's a little crazy, but it may end up being a good idea. Some of the crazy ideas we have are good ideas in the long run, especially if your garden is is better suited for the change and the plants do better. So uh, have fun with that. I, I spend a lot of time trying to figure it out so I don't have to redo, but I'm always redoing things because you discover along the way what works and what doesn't and can't always forecast exactly what's going to work and how well it's going to work. And you might have to redo it. So. Uh, have, have fun with that. That sounds like it could be a nice long project over the course of the winter moving into spring to redo a garden space. Colorblind Gardener says, my craziest thing is probably trees growing in trash cans. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say that ranks on the craziness scale. I don't want them in the ground, so I have a Meyer lemon and a fig tree in 20-gallon commercial trash cans. And so uh, I would say that that enters the scale of craziness but again, to me, it sounds like a great idea. In my region of Colorado, Zone 5B, Meyer lemons and fig trees would not survive in the ground. And so the only way to grow them is in a container. And a 20-gallon trash can is actually big enough for the roots and big enough to support those plants. So I, I say that starts on the color, or that starts on the crazy scale, colorblind gardener. But I'm going to say that was a, that's a good decision. 
And others might say it's crazy because 20 gallon cans that are loaded with soil with a tree growing out of them are not easy to deal with. They're not easy to move into protected areas. So yes, that's a little crazy to take that much effort to grow those trees. But tell us about the satisfaction level, how, how fun that is to get to the point when you can be harvesting lemons and harvesting figs when others around you aren't. I say that negates that whole craziness aspect and actually shows that you are a bit smarter than, than the rest of us. And Yankee Sista says, yep, great idea. I don't want to dig in rock to plant mine. So there you have it. Yeah, growing in containers, it's it's a crazy amount of effort and a crazy amount of, of extra information you have to learn to have success with it. But ultimately, it really can be a, a good answer. Mr. Grim13 saying my craziest might be that I'm trying to germinate pawpaw seeds to grow for root stock for a hedgerow. Plan on grafting my trees that fruit throughout my area. Wow. Yes. I, yeah, that's that's on the craziness scale. Absolutely. Um, but again, how fantastic that would be if you have success with it. So so this this is in that range of trying to set a world record uh, super hot pepper or heavy pumpkin. I, I would say trying to germinate pawpaw seeds for rootstock for other fruit trees ventures into that realm. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. You're going to learn a lot about the 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 seeds the germination the grafting all that i love it i think that's fantastic so by all means that's the kind of crazy that i'm enthusiastic about so good for you that that's that's a good kind of crazy absolutely and lily's wondering is it crazy to pull out grape plants because of vine thrips no. if if it's crazy then there's a lot of people that are pulling out a lot of plants because of their craziness. If if you have a pest that you can't get rid of and you are growing the plants that brings in that pest, and at some point, this is where the, the uh, Einstein insanity definition comes in. If you keep trying to grow the grape plants, and you never get grapes because the plants are always too weak and they're always dying because of the vine thrips, then no, it's not crazy at all. Again, it's being the kind of gardener who recognizes what's working and what's not working, and then taking the appropriate action in your garden to make sure that it, it isn't a waste of time. It's okay to be crazy. It's okay to experiment. It's okay to spend time working towards a goal, but we each have to decide for ourselves at what point it's a waste of time. And I think that's a key difference when, when we're talking about my craziness spectrum is the waste of our time and our effort and our money. If we're getting nothing from it, then it's a waste. If we're getting even a glimmer of that hope or a glimmer of that satisfaction or a glimmer of that exhilaration, then I think it's worth it. And, and I think the, the craziness factor is worth whatever others may be telling about uh, uh, that gardener Scott. I can't believe what he's trying in his garden. I'm okay for people to talk to me about that way. It's all about my satisfaction and what I'm doing and what I'm enjoying. And when I get to that wasting of time, then I pull the plant. And I've pulled a lot of plants over the years because they ended up being a waste of time. But there's also a lot of plants that are still growing that I still have hope for because that's what we gardeners do is have hope for it. Wormler says, I lost about 35 pounds this year and I'm attributing it to the garden. We'll test that theory out next year. That's awesome. Yeah, it's healthy to be in the garden, both physically and mentally. So um, there's something I don't think I've talked about before. When we talk about garden journals and tracking what's happening in your garden, 
you lost 35 pounds this year. I think you should have that in your garden journal. And that's definitely something to, to test out the theory and track it for next year. So uh, I like that idea. Shandy's garden. Well, adjusting the garden is not for sun tracking purposes, but it's definitely for more accessibility. It's too tight. I also decided which methods and varieties I like best. Things need more room. Yeah, that that I'm, I'm glad you clarified that because uh, I I talk about that in some of my raised bed videos of some of the mistakes that we make when we grow in raised beds in particular, and spacing is a big part of that. And if you can't get to the plants, if you can't pull the hose to get the water to the plants, if it's difficult harvesting, then it does make sense to redo the garden space so that you're not working as hard as you might otherwise. Tennessee Man is wondering, does anyone else talk to their plants? So there you go. That's definitely on the craziness spectrum, talking to plants. Now, most of you are probably aware of studies that were done back in the 60s and 70s in particular, where the, the researchers played music and talked to plants. And the, the results with some of those experiments that were, re, were replicated don't always match. But some studies do show that plants can benefit from the noise, from the sound waves, be it the music or the talking. And, and I haven't read anywhere yet for anyone able to definitively say why it affects the plants, but it does seem to affect the plants. So uh, yeah, I talk to my plants. I don't necessarily talk to my plants the same way like I talk to Mala, but as I'm working with my plants, I encourage them. As I transplant something that's particularly small, I give it encouragement and tell it to grow big like its brothers and sisters. So uh, yeah, I do. How about the rest of you? Are you are you talking to your plants? Wyoming skies, good morning to you. I tried growing gooseberry in zone 5B and the plant stayed so tiny and produced literally one berry. Recommendations for gooseberry in my zone, please. <clears throat> now gooseberries are different than ground cherries. And so uh, ground cherries are related to uh, tomatoes and and they they need to be grown a little bit differently than the gooseberries. So gooseberries are a perennial shrub, whereas ground cherries are an annual garden plant. And so as far as the gooseberry in zone 5B, I'm growing gooseberry shrubs in my garden. I had a fantastic harvest this year. I'm grow I have um let's see I was harvesting from six different gooseberry plants. And time is a big factor. I put those plants in the ground uh most of them 3 years ago, uh a couple of them 4 years ago. And so last year I might have gotten one gooseberry, I might have gotten two, but it, it it takes three to four years for them to get established to the point that they can produce. So uh, depending on how long you've been trying to grow the gooseberries, it could just be a time factor. If it's less than three or four years, don't worry about it. Give it more time. And when you get to that point, they, they should be producing. But in my 5B area, they survived the cold and they've survived my summer heat and the soil really isn't that good where I put my gooseberries and they still performed. I did put manure in that area and they're well uh, mulched with wood chips. And so between the manure and the wood chips and regular watering, my gooseberries have done fine. So um, the recommendations are to uh, make sure that you're picking a variety or two that, that do well. Gwen's Buffalo, oh no, I'm sorry, that's actually the current. Um, the gooseberries, I'm trying to think of some of the varieties I have because I've got like four or five different varieties, but I just look for varieties that uh, can handle a zone five and they did fine. So make sure you've got varieties that can handle the cold and then just give it some time and Hopefully you'll have you'll have better results. 
Reverend Dell planted okra only because someone told me I did it didn't do well in 5B upstate New York. Had fabulous okra that year. I wasn't sure what the heck to do with it. Is that crazy? <clears throat> Sometimes I think a challenge brings the craziness out in us. So, so absolutely. If you're told you can't do something and it's not going to grow, then it's a little crazy to try it. But then when it's successful, who's crazy now? It's those other people that thought it was crazy that I think now become crazy when you can prove them wrong and show that it actually is something that that can work and actually does do well. And so Sherry says, sounds as though we're all on the spectrum. So and absolutely. And that's, that's kind of an underlying theme that I intended for the show today is that that we all are on the spectrum, the crazy spectrum when it comes to being a gardener. And I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm actually proud of my craziness because I like to brag about my successes. You know, I'll also talk about the disappointments and the failures, but I think most gardeners really do like to brag about their successes. And the crazier it is that leads to your success is a better story to tell. So why not? Why not up the craziness factor so that we have a better story to tell as we move forward? It's composting is something I do. Most of you are composters. I compost just about everything I have from the kitchen and the garden. And a number of years ago, almost 20 years ago, before I knew a fraction of what I know now, I had a plant just appear one day in the garden, didn't know what it was, didn't put it there, didn't know why it was growing, but I let it grow. That's crazy in itself. Growing something that you didn't put there, you don't know what it is, and you don't know what's going to happen, definitely high on the crazy spectrum. It ended up being a melon, a cantaloupe, and I got one off the plant. I figure that from the cantaloupe that we ate and threw into the compost pile, that there were some seeds in the compost pile, wasn't a hot pile. I used that compost in my garden. One of those seeds sprouted and it grew the cantaloupe melon plant. By far the best test, best tasting melon I've ever had in my entire life. So maybe high on the craziness, but absolutely fantastically high on the story that can be told about it, but also the memory that it creates because it was just so fantastic to have that success. I've never been able to replicate it. I've tried growing those melons and never had the same success. So didn't even try, didn't even work that hard, huge success. I think that's crazy in itself. So why not have a story to tell? And if you can ramp up, amp up the craziness level, go for it. Serena says, last year I only harvested one good bulb of garlic, but it looks like next year will be more rainy and cooler than this, according to the Farmer's Almanac. <clears throat> yeah, depending on where you are, um, this may end up being a, a crazy winter into spring. There's um, El Nino, I think it is, is the primary factor for those of us in the middle of the U.S. And so they're calling for us to have a wetter winter moving into spring. And we'll just have to wait and see what it looks like. My garlic crop was terrible this last year. And at my garden club meeting on Saturday, we had a, a local grower come in and he actually raises garlic. And he has a farm east of me, farther out in the plains, and had one of his best years. But as as he, we we were listening to him and and I commented to one of the gardeners sitting next to me, I said, this was the, one of the worst years I ever had. And she said, yes, me too. And I've talked with others that I know in this area that all said the same thing. In, in my part of Colorado, it was a terrible garlic year. And it was rainy and it was cool and that's not normal which is why it probably wasn't a normal harvest for those of us that had the that that issue with our garlic 
it's not saying I'm not growing garlic. I've got garlic all ready for next year and we'll see how the harvest goes in July when I'm typically harvesting, keeping my fingers crossed for what's gonna happen with the weather. But even when we don't get, this is where the crazy comes in, Serena, is you get one good bulb of garlic, but let me guess, you're going to grow garlic again, right? That sounds crazy, but that's just what we do. So let's keep our fingers crossed about the weather and hope that it cooperates with us as we move forward. Oh, there she, there she is again, growing 35 cloves of garlic. Good, eight elephant and 27 purple German hardneck. Good for you. So yes, you answered the question. You only get one good bulb, but you're gonna do it again. So 35 cloves is good. And let us know how it goes uh, next year when we're all harvesting our garlic. I'm sure I'll have a garlic show <clears throat> and so we can share our stories and try to remember that we were talking about it at this point. And so uh, here's a story that I, I love telling gardening stories that fall into that craziness factor. So um, it's been three years ago, I think, <clears throat> at least two, I think three. Um, I was growing 15 different varieties of garlic, had them all laid out in nice rows in one of my raised beds, had I was actually growing two rows of each garlic and had a tag for all the garlic. <clears throat> and then terrible, terrible storm literally broke the plant tags and blew away the broken pieces. I did not know what garlic I was growing at that point. I had a whole bunch of garlic. I basically 30 rows of garlic with generally about six of the cloves per row. And it was just a guess from that point. So great harvest that year. I saved a whole bunch of the cloves to then plant again for the next year. And in that next year, which I guess would have been last year, I, I had saved the cloves again and planted them for the next year not knowing what I was planting. I like knowing what I'm planting. I like knowing the varieties of the garlic. I like knowing so I can put it in the journal which ones are doing best. And I was oblivious, but I kept growing because I like garlic and I can tell that some's purple, some's purple stripe, some is white, some's hard neck, some is the soft neck. And I just use what I harvest. This year, I actually did purchase some garlic so that I could know what I was growing and I'll use different labels moving forward. I'm still going to keep growing all of that unnamed mysterious garlic. I think that measures on the craziness scale. I'm growing garlic that I don't know what it is, but it does well and I like growing it and I'm going to keep growing it. So one of those things to think about. In fact, I'm wearing my planter shirt today. My planter is the, the gardening app I started using. And the nice thing about planter is moving forward now that I'm using that planning app is I can put the garlic in my bed, use my phone to then identify which row is which, and I don't have to worry about the, uh, the broken plant tags. I still use plant tags, but if the plant tags get destroyed, I've got the backup in my planter app moving into the future. So I, I kind of wanted for myself to set that baseline of the garlic varieties that I know I like to grow and start buying some of those bulbs to then save into the future so that I can have a very clear idea of which variety is doing the best in my garden. And so it, it's helpful for the planter link. It's one of my affiliates that I have in the description below. And it makes a big difference. If if you live in an area where your plant tags are going to disappear and end up a mystery harvest when it comes to, to the plants that you're growing. Jay, hashtag crazy gardening. I've tried negotiating with rabbits and squirrels and discovered that many of them are liars. <laughs> yes, I, I would say any animal you're trying to negotiate, I would not trust what they have to say. And 
I'll just leave that at that. Leanna S. grew Lufa Gorge last season. Very crazy point. I would agree with that. Wound up giving Lufa on a rope and Lufa soap to everyone in the family last Christmas. And there's still leftovers from one seed. That's fantastic. That's that's a, that's a craziness that is a great story and great results. Absolutely. Lufas can be difficult to grow, especially in regions like mine, because they need a lot of time on the plant to get to that point where that, that lufa, the internal structure of the gourd is, is what we turn into lufa on a rope and lufa soap. But when you can grow that, oh yeah, it's really cool. And they really do make good gifts. So good for you, Leanne. That, that's awesome. And it starts with one seed. Now the craziness factor, if you want to ratchet this up a little bit, each of those lufa gourds, as you know, and for, for everyone else, a lufa gourd has hundreds of seeds in it at the end of the season. So you can start with one seed and kind of like the garlic, never have to buy it again once you know what it is that you're growing and save those lufa seeds and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep giving it away. Who knows? It might even turn into a home business if you can grow that many and make that much loofah soap. So uh, I, I like stuff like that. And Tennessee Nana says, there's an excellent book, The Secret Life of Plants by Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird. Oh yeah, absolute book. Um, I have most of The Secret Life, um, Secret Life of Trees, I think I did a video on. And um, it's, those are, those are good books. So uh, I'm planning... In an, within the next couple of weeks of doing a video, we'll talk about gifts for gardeners over the holidays. And I'm old school. I think books are always great for gardeners. I think gardeners should have a reference library. And any book that we can add to our reference library is a good thing that we can do. And so um, I do have some of my older videos where I, I review some books and I'll probably be making more. But yeah, Secret Life of Plants is, is a good one. So thank you for saying that. <clears throat> and so nice to have Eli on with us today. And uh, yeah, you, you, you and I have no similarities when it comes to what we do in the garden and how we approach some of our, our methods and our planning. Absolutely. And so it's a lot of fun. And, and that's what it's all about, I think, is fun. I... I think back to my youth, many of you are probably the same way, and the crazy times we'd have. We'd go dancing and, and just be crazy. We'd go to a ball game and just be crazy. And so that's what I I like to, to have again, when I go into the garden and just get crazy in the garden with the new things, the, the stuff I'm building, the things that that I'm adding to the garden. And, and you know, even... Even some of the, the art, garden art, I think is important in a garden because it adds that little bit of craziness factor. And I've got toads and I've got frogs and I have gnomes and I have lots of those things in my garden, often for me, but a lot of it is for my grandkids. I'll put garden art like those frogs, for instance, and the toads, I'll put them underneath perennial bushes and, and shrubs and flowers so that you don't see them when you're just walking around the garden. But if you go into the garden, you discover that there's a family of toads living underneath the honeysuckle vines. I like that. I like that a lot. And and I, I think we've all seen those houses with the garden art, especially the gnomes. And we think, man, that's crazy. But it's only crazy for us on the outside. I don't think a lot of this is crazy for us on the inside that are actually enjoying those kind of things because we like doing those kind of things. So that's what I'm encouraging is don't worry about the people thinking you're crazy from the outside. Be crazy on the inside and have fun with it, every aspect of it. Sherry's saying, I'm transplanting my aloe today. She's not a food crop here, but has saved my skin after kitchen burns a number of times. Good for you. Yeah, aloe is a nice plant to, to, 
to have on hand. I've got aloe growing in my bedroom and I've, I've cut off a tip at, you know, intervals along the, uh, the way over the years for those burns. So yeah, that, that's a good tip. If you haven't grown the, uh, the garlic or not the garlic, the aloe, um, grow it and, and use it for those kind of purposes for helping out the skin. And so I wouldn't go this far, Sherry. Um, I'm crazy, but I don't, I'm not a basketball shorts in the garden kind of crazy, but you never know. Um, I have thought about what I want to do in the future on International Naked Gardening Day. So who knows how crazy we can all get in the garden with what we wear or don't wear. I haven't been naked in the garden, but it's it's something that you see International Naked Gardening Day. And be honest, you've thought about it, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, you're a little crazy. I think we all are when it comes to that. Let's Let's go ahead and change the subject right now and talk about the background that I have today. This comes from Todd Layfield, beautiful garden from a few weeks back. And you, you can just think about, this is the kind of garden that, that I reference when I talk about my aunt's garden and growing a vegetable garden. I can see just coming out in the early evening to do a harvest to go back in for whatever that night's dinner is going to be. And I, I want to point out, if you look at the fencing, and so this is one of those things, and, and I've showed different gardens over the, the last few years that, that cover both sides of it. When you put up a fence in and around your garden, it can serve multiple purposes. And so much of the fencing I have around my plants and that I'm planning to put into my garden is to keep the animals out, the deer in particular. And so the fencing is purely a barrier to a pest. And I've had fencing in previous gardens with deer and grew plants on those fences. And the deer would eat those plants through the fence. And so the fence was purely a barrier to keep the deer out. And ultimately I didn't grow many plants along the fence. But in this garden, as you can see, Todd is using the fencing as trellising. So the fencing can keep out the rabbits and the, the, the deer in particular, but depending on the pest, depending on the plant, you can use the fence as a trellis and get more space. So a fence around your garden doesn't necessarily mean that that's wasted space. You can definitely use it. So enjoyed seeing that. And then you can see um, the, the, the post trellis that he also has in the area. There's a hoop house covered with shade cloth in the back. You can see some raised beds that are also growing. So this is, I think, another great example, and thank you, Todd, for sharing this, of, of gardens that don't need to be all the same thing. You can have covered hoops, you can have the raised beds, a lot of in-ground growing in this garden, different kinds of trellises, and that's, that's one of the best things that I think we all can do is try the different things, see how they work, and you may like all of them sitting side by side. You may discover that you like raised beds better than in-ground beds, or that you like in-ground beds better than raised beds, or you like containers better, or growing in your hoop house is the best of all. Those are the kind of things that you don't discover until you do it. And so Todd's got a lot happening in the garden. And thank you for sharing it. Maybe you all see something in there that can give you an idea of something you might want to try as well. But anything that's got a green space that you can go out and spend some time in, I think, is a good idea. So share your photos with me. I have more in the queue in the weeks ahead. But I'm always looking for what's happening in your garden. And you can send it to Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com, landscape, full file size, and I'll add it to the queue. Give me permission to use it by all means. And thank you, Jay, for putting that up. And we can talk about that now. 
It is sent to Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com. Written permission is probably the most important thing. I've, I've had a few photos in recent weeks that I got that are wonderful, and, and I respond and say thank you. But if I don't have permission to use them in the live stream, then I won't show them. And so I suspect some of you have sent me pictures over the years and wonder why I didn't show your picture. Often that's the reason. I'm, I don't want to, to infringe on your copyright and I will do it only if you give me permission. And I do hope that you consider doing that. So Kimberly saying, she's yelling at me, answer my question. Well, I'm sorry, Kimberly, I didn't see your question. So there have been hundreds of comments that have come by. And so I don't know what your comment is. So you don't have to yell at me. If you repeat the question again, I'm more likely to see it. But as I'm talking, as I'm looking at the camera, I can't see everybody's question. So I know some are missed. And as I talk about, I mean, if you want, if you want me to see uh, that, that's where the, the super chat or the, the super sticker comes into play. I, I, I always see those. I'm scrolling up to see if I come across. But I'm not saying there's a lot and lot of of comments that I'm looking at. And I don't see that one in particular. So you don't have to yell at me, but do repeat the question. And it's more likely for me to see it if, like Willie, and like you did, at Gardner Scott, my neighbors think I'm crazy for my second year compost everything mission. I love that. They ask what my secret is for my lush plants. I say lots of turning and a pinch of patience. Thank you for that, Willie. I like that. Uh and, and again, this is crazy from the outside versus crazy from the inside. So your neighbors think you're crazy for composting everything. I think that's an awesome experience and, and something awesome to attempt is to compost everything. And, and almost literally, you can compost everything organic that's going to decompose, that's going to break down. That is one of those fun experiments. I have a video talking about crazy. Uh, I hadn't even thought about this to talk about today until this, your question. But I did a video a few years ago about the crazy things you can compost, including shoes and hair and vacuum, uh, vac vacuum bag waste. Dump your vacuum bag in your compost pile. So yeah, I've got a crazy composting video that that lists some things that people wouldn't normally think you could compost. But I agree with you, Willie. There's a lot that can be composted and others looking in may think it crazy, but it is one of those things that if it works, if it decomposes and you can add it to your garden and get those lush plants, then hey, who cares what it is that you're composting? I think it actually plays to your benefit and everybody else's benefit when you can compost something like that, that uh, others think you're crazy and then you are you have the final laugh as to whether it, it worked or not. And I, I think if it works, then it's something that isn't crazy, unless it's crazy enough to tell a story about. Kimberly lives in northern, western Pennsylvania. We have had a few frosts and was thinking of bringing some of the pepper plants inside. They seem to be doing very well. What do you think? Uh, and so uh, we, uh, I've talked about overwintering peppers in the past. A lot of it depends on on how much longer the season is. And this also plays into the craziness factor as well. I think it's crazy when the temperatures start dropping, when the cold weather is coming, and there's that last pepper that's on the plant, or maybe there's still some flowers on the plant. It's a little crazy to think that if you leave the plant in the ground that it's going to produce anymore. And so avoid that craziness. And I think it's usually best when you want to dig up a plant and overwinter it to do it when it's still warm outside, when you can still get out and enjoy the day and it's not 
blowing snow that you're dealing with. So as far as if they're doing well now and if the weather is still good, it might be the right time to get out and dig them up, prune off branches and leaves, clean off roots, prune those roots a little bit, put them into a container moving into the winter. And especially if you put them into a cool spot and cut back on any light that they might be getting, they're essentially going to enter a dormancy. It's not really dormant. They're just going to not put out new leaves and new flowers and new fr fruit unless they're in a warm spot with a lot of light. And so doing that when the weather cooperates, I think is a good plan. So like, for instance, here in Colorado uh, today, we're supposed to be uh, at about 75 degrees, 24 degrees Celsius for a high. And that's close to record setting temp for temperature for this time of year. Next Sunday, my forecast high temperature is going to be 33 degrees Fahrenheit, high temperature, one degree Celsius, a high in less than a week. So for me, as I'm looking at bringing in pepper plants, I've got uh, rosemary, I've got a, a pomegranate tree, I have plants that are in containers that need to be brought in, and I'm looking at this week with my forecast being so cold. The high is going to be 33 degrees Fahrenheit. The low is forecast to be 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus seven. So right now, my nighttime temperatures are warmer. My daytime temperatures are warmer. And as I get to the end of the week, I'm going to be bringing in all of those plants from outside because they're going to be exposed to severe cold temperatures, which will be a shock to the plant. It's better to avoid that shock and bring them in when I can handle it and the plants can handle it and not worry about what the weather is going to do to those plants. So that's generally how I look at the plants that I'm considering bringing in. Sherry's saying, my dog contributes greatly to the compost. He sheds like crazy, as does Sid, Sid the snake in the garage. And so, yeah, absolutely. Snake skin and dog hair. So when I, uh, I don't do it often, and usually I treat it as a carbon source. Mala came up behind me. She's hot. She must be laying out in the sun. Um, and so when I, when I do empty the garbage bag into my compost, it's usually dog hair. And I'm intentionally adding that because it is dog hair and it, it, it is slow to break down but it does help aerate the, the pile and uh, it is something that can be composted. It's kind of crazy. So uh, have, have fun with that. I haven't, I haven't composted snake skin. Uh, well, actually, so at the Galileo greenhouse, I had a huge population of garter snakes and at the most, at one time, I forget what it's called. There's a technical term for when snakes mate and they they form like a ball. They all join up in a little ball and that's one of the ways they mate. And so one day I went into the greenhouse and there was a ball of snakes in between the raised beds. And at that point, I think there were nine snakes. But at, the, at one time, the most that I observed sunning themselves around the edges of the greenhouse was 13 snakes in that greenhouse. And I know that's a crazy factor that I would allow 13 snakes in the greenhouse. It was a big greenhouse and I love it. Snakes are wonderful for the garden. And when they would shed, they would often leave behind the skin. And though I don't remember intentionally saving the skin as something I was going to add to the compost, I can say that when I was cleaning up the beds and there was snake skin around some of the plants and then I composted those plants, I guess I have composted snake skin. So interesting. I've never thought about that before, but it is something that uh, 
you can compost anything. And so I didn't make an effort to take the snake skin out of the compost. Fun. I, I didn't think the craziness would extend to this point. Hey, Sherry, got a, a um, oh, I, that was the, the snake skin. It, I meant to click on Masabi Gal, got a green chicken egg last night. Awesome. So uh, the, the green chicken eggs, the red chicken eggs, the orange chicken eggs, the blue chicken eggs, that's all fun of, of having chickens when you start getting those rainbow colored eggs. And my granddaughters uh, have enjoyed that. They're not as interested in the chickens that they have anymore, but my daughter always chose chickens so that they could get some of those colorful eggs. And the green ones are pretty cool. And so, and Mr. Grimm is saying, ball of snakes in the greenhouse, that would lose the greenhouse for me. Um, but it's fun. It really is, is fun. And I agree with Susan that snakes are better than raccoons. So um, don't discount the snakes. It, it definitely is high on the crazy factor. Now, do I like snakes? Did the, uh, I would say, yes, in the garden, but I'm not a pick up and play with a snake kind of person. Did the snakes scare me every time I saw them slithering or if I was working a plant and suddenly there's a snake there? Of course it did. So so there is a craziness in factor when you're gardening with snakes. Garter snakes are okay. I know that some of you may have encountered some of the, the more dangerous ones. I've had people comment about cottonmouth snakes in their garden and rattlesnakes in their garden. So that's a completely different factor. Garter snakes, I'm okay with. The others, not so much. And I think that's a, a big factor when we talk about the snakes. Sunset Gazing is wondering, what is a good grow light? All numbers and colors are confusing. All the numbers and colors are confusing to choose from. Also, do pomegranates only fruit on new growth? If yes, do you prune in fall and winter? Um, and so um, I've got some videos on grow lights and some of the ones that that I've used and some of the ones that that I like. And so some of them are relatively recent, just this last grow season. So you can just do a search on the Gardner Scott channel of lights and you'll see the videos pop up and I give some, some ideas for some of the lights I'm using. And I also have uh, one video in particular, it's a few years old, where I talk about those numbers and which what the numbers mean and how to decipher the numbers. So I've got a whole video about that. We don't have enough time and to, in the show to, to, to give all the answers. So check out some of those videos in my library and they should answer all the questions that you have. As to the pomegranates, so um, I live in zone 5B, as I've mentioned here in Colorado. Pomegranates are only good down to, I, down to, I think, zone seven. And really zone eight, I think, is a better cutoff for that. So I'm growing it in a pot. Again, something that I need to bring inside. Pomegranates do need some cool conditions, some chill hours. And I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure it, they fruit on old growth, uh, but I have never grown it before. I got it from uh, Charles, my buddy at IV Organic. And I can't answer all those questions yet because it's still a one-year-old plant and this is the first year and I honestly haven't looked into it yet because I know it's too early. It's going to be another couple of years before I actually get any fruit on it. And that's the time I'll probably look into more of the specifics as to the pruning and what I need to do. So I can't give you a definitive answer, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that like most fruit trees, you prune it depending on what you want to accomplish. So for structural pruning, you do that into winter. To encourage fruit spurs and more tip growth, you prune it in the summer. And so as it grows uh, a little bit more, I'll make that differentiation of how I want to structure the tree. And I do most of my fruit tree pruning in in late winter, early spring when the tree is dormant and that tends to work best. But yeah, expect to hear more about the pomegranate tree in the future uh, as I do more with it and I figure out how to grow 
pomegranates, which is something that I've never done before. Yankee Sista, always nice to have you here. Picked up some great tips today. Great live cast, Gardner Scott. This community is amazing. I will second and third that motion. And thank you so much for, for helping out the channel with that. And it really is a fantastic group, isn't it? Lily saying, would you compost dead chickens in your vegetable garden? You could, absolutely. And and I've I've done fish in the past as an experiment. The only issue when you compost an animal is that it could attract other animals. So when you're composting something like the chickens, then you might be bringing in vermin that you don't want, or even scavengers that are big and scary and might be something you don't want your dog tangling with. That's the biggest issue when you compost any of those animal materials. So can you? Yes. In fact, there's, I think, I know Oregon, I'm pretty sure Washington, and now Colorado just this last year have laws that allow for humans to be composted. And so there are actually businesses in Oregon and, and Colorado, I know for sure, that you can compost yourself, you can compost your loved ones, and very specialized process, of course, to allow that to happen. You can go to Colorado State University's website, and there's information on how to compost a cow. And so absolutely, you, there, those things can be composted. You just have to be aware of what you need to do to keep those scavengers from coming into your garden and making things worse because that's really what you don't want to, to have happen is um, the, the, uh, the, the pests that we have now are enough to deal with. It's those new pests that we can bring into our garden because of those crazy things that we do that we have to worry about. So uh, compost chickens, but I would probably bury them well and you don't have to worry about the odor that comes from decaying animals as well. Something to think about and something that I'm definitely thinking about. So, okay, let's see. I'm going to do one more quick scan. Serena's saying, still waiting for an answer to a question about squash bugs and garlic. I even put it in all caps. When I see all caps, I often scroll past it. I, I Like I said earlier, it's the yelling at me that I really don't like. So I honestly did not see your question about squash bugs and garlic. So I don't know what the question is. And again, I can't answer all the questions because there's just too many of them. I don't know what the question was, but I'll say squash bugs don't bother garlic. So if that's what you're asking, you can grow garlic and the squash bugs are not going to bother it. Completely different type of bug for different kind of plants. It's not in their diet. And so it's something that they're typically not going to be worrying or not wasting their time on in the garden. Masabi gal, my daughter put chicken guts and feathers in the compost. Just buried them in grass clippings and haven't had a problem. There you go. Yeah, that's the idea. Burying them so that you don't have the aroma and your neighbors won't complain, but less likely to bring in the, the, the scavengers that could cause problems. Humor says, doctors are not taught nutritional facts in the whole 12 years that they're in school. They learn only about three to four hours of nutritional facts. The rest is all give you drugs. So I'm not sure if that's in reference to someone else's comments. Um, but, you know, as, as we garden, and like I said, I like to know what it is I'm growing. I like to know the varieties. I like to know the, the plants. But, but that's one of, the, one of the reasons I like doing that is so that I can delve deeper and learn more about the taste, the nutrients, and what my plants offer me because they do offer different things. The, the nutrients in a tomato that you eat are different than the nutrients in a sweet potato, which is different than the nutrients in garlic, which is different than the nutrients in a carrot. And when I went through the Master Gardener program, 
that was one of those things that it was a very broad education. And I have maybe two hours of master gardener training on plants and the nutrients that plants provide. And so whether it's a doctor or a gardener, those are the kind of things you've got to learn for yourself often if you want to learn more about it. Now, nutritionists will go to school and they'll learn a lot more. And I've worked at the Galileo Garden. That was one of the things that we were able to do. We actually had some local nutritionists that helped us in the garden. And so as we were teaching the kids about growing plants and teaching the kids about the nutrition of the harvest, we would actually have nutritionists there talking about what we were harvesting and how best to serve it to get all the benefits of the vitamins and the nutrition. And so if you're looking to seek out that information, go to, to the nutritionist, to the experts whose job it is to know what is in our food. And they're a much better source of the information that we should, I think, know that we're consuming if we're growing our food for the purpose of consuming it. And this is the time of year, especially with the preservation, depending on how you preserve your harvests, will impact the vitamins and the nutrition within that food. So again, helpful to know that kind of information, especially as you are, are harvesting and preserving and feeding your family the food that you're growing. So one of those things that it could be on the craziness scale and you could venture deep into that information, but I don't think so. I think the more information we can have when it comes to our gardening, the better it is. And people have called me crazy because of how deep I delve into some of the topics I discuss in some of my videos, saying that that information is unnecessary for a video, and I disagree. I put in as much information as I can because I think information is important. So there's some homework for the week. Get out there. Learn more about some of the things that you're doing, especially if you think it's a little bit crazy. Once you do the research, you may find out it's really not that crazy. There's a lot of other people doing the same thing. And I'll be doing this same thing next Monday. Same time, same channel, same idea. We'll talk gardening to start your gardening week. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.